All right, the veteran's name is Major Jack Morgan. He was born February 18th, 1926. He served in World War II from 1944 to 1946. He achieved the rank of third class petty officer. I am recording this on October 12th, 2015. My name is Tatum Koval and I'm conducting this interview and there's no relation. All right, Major Morgan, where were you born? I was born just out of Westminster, South Carolina. Westminster, South Carolina. Do you have any siblings? No. No siblings? No. Okay. I was married twice, but my first wife wasn't able to have kids. Okay. And I was 50 years old when I married the second time, and I didn't want any kids. Yeah. <laughs> so, did you go to high school in Westminster, South Carolina? Well, we only lived up there a short time, and then we moved to Seneca. Okay. And I was raised around Seneca there. Okay. And what, uh, did you play any sports in high school? I went to Oakway High School. Okay. Uh, grammar school and high school because we lived just out of Seneca, so we was uh, assigned to Oakway, which is not Oakway anymore, it's West Oak. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> did the you? The reason they called it Oakway, uh -huh. they used to have horse races over there uh -huh. in the summertime. Of course, a lot of the farmers had horses. We had one too. Uh -huh. But what the name Oakway was called in the middle of the separated, where the roads separated, one went to, uh, to fair play and one went to crossroads. Uh -huh. There was a tree in the way and they had to go around that tree. And a guy was racing and he made that turn and he leaned in too far and his head hit the tree and they killed it. It killed oh, him. Wow. So they called it Oak Way. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. It was an oak tree, so that's why they called it Oak Way. Yeah. <laughs> so did you enjoy growing up in Seneca, South Carolina? Yes. Yeah. Did you play any sports in high school? I played basketball. Okay. Yes. Great. All four years? And, well, I played, back then they had a junior team when I was in grammar school, mm -hmm. uh, sixth and seventh grade, I played on the junior team, and then when I got to high school, I played on the senior team. Okay. I played, I think, for six years. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's great. So when was it that you were called for the draft? I didn't get that. When was it that you were called for the draft of World War II? I, I, um, what year did you graduate high school? Uh, 1943. 1943. And I you went in the Navy in 1944. 1944, okay. In February, two days before I was 18. Wow, okay. My daddy, I talked to him into letting me join the Navy because uh -huh. he was in the Army in World War I. And uh, he didn't want me to go in the Navy, but he... he uh, he finally would give in and sign for me because yeah. you couldn't go in the Navy unless, or Army unless you was 18. Wow. But if you were 17, if you had somebody to sign, for your parents to sign for you, you could go in. Okay. So he signed for me two days before I was 18. Wow. I didn't want to go in the Army because I was watch we were watching the news and I seen them people sleeping in foxholes and the rain and all that so I didn't want that so yeah I went in the Navy wow so your dad fought in World War one your dad fought in World War one did I do what <laughs> your father and fought he, in World War one he was in the army in World War one okay uh, General John Persian Persian promoted him to lieutenant over in Germany when they was he was in the Lost Battalion over there. Okay. And then when they got back together, uh, John J. Pershing, which was the general, uh, promoted him to lieutenant. Wow, wow. So was your mom upset that you wanted to that you joined the war, or was she in support? No, because there was seven of us boys, and she was probably glad to get rid of. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, that makes sense yeah. then. <laughs> I already had one brother in the Army. Okay. And then later on I had uh, two brothers in the Army. Uh -huh. But I was the only Navy in the bunch. Okay. Were your other brothers fighting in World War II no, also? No, uh, my brother that was this, the oldest brother was in the Army, but he never left the United States. Okay. He went in in 39, and, but he never left the United States. And my uh, brother younger than me went to Germany just before the war was over over there, but he didn't, wasn't in no battles. And then my brother younger than him spent 21 years in the Army, but he was a cook. Oh. <laughs> Did he enjoy cooking at home, or did he just have to learn when he went into the army? Did he enjoy cooking at home for you guys? Well, yeah, he still does. He lives in Jacksonville, Florida now. Okay. He, he retired out of the army and then retired from the postal service in Jacksonville. And uh, I seen him the other day, and he's doing fine. Good. He married, he married a German girl while he was in Germany. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And they both came back over here? Yeah. yeah, they've been back here now about 15 years. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Well, I believe he got out of the Army in 96. Mm-hmm. Uh, no. That's when he retired from the Postal Service. Okay. But he retired 20 <laughs> years before that out of the Army. So, uh, but they've been back here since uh, about... Uh, 75. 75. Okay. Wow. So, you joined the Navy, contrary to your father being in the Army. Yeah. Um, and at first he wanted you to join the Army? Well, he sort of wanted me to go to the Army, but I didn't want to sleep in foxholes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I went in the Navy. So what was your training like to be in the Navy? What was your training like to be in the Navy? When I went in the Navy, uh, I was lucky. They said there was 30-something uh, of us went in at the same time. Mm -hmm. Shipmates, uh, uh, high school mates that I knew, and uh, some of them were. And uh, I was lucky they sent me to Jacksonville, Florida, Naval Air Station. Okay. And uh, I was down there. We only had two weeks of boot camp where the rest of them that went in when I did went to Bainbridge, Maryland, where there's snow on the ground, and they had eight weeks of boot camp. <laughs> and I finished the boot camp down there, and mm -hmm. when I come home on leave and went back, they had they said you, because they kept giving us tests to see what we were qualified for, uh -huh. and they said you're qualified for three things. Okay. You can be a, a tail gunner on a fighter plane, but that's three years training. And this was 44. I said, no, I, I don't want to do that. Yeah. I said, you can be a signalman on an aircraft carrier to signal planes in. So I didn't want that. They said, you can go to <clears throat> Gulfport, Mississippi to school, engineering school. I said, I'll take that. Yeah. So I went down there for eight weeks, engineering mm -hmm. school, and when I finished that down there, they asked, they, they told me, said, now you can stay here for diesel mechanic school. So I said, okay. So I stayed in Gulfport another six weeks. Uh -huh. Then when that was over, they sent me to Solomons, Maryland. That's about 50 or 60 miles south, southeast of Washington, D.C., okay. where, you know, Maryland come, goes down the, the coast. Mm -hmm. And I was there training on a London Craft tank. What that was is a <clears throat> London Craft that was supposed, was built to carry tanks in on Londons when they had an Amphib landing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, was, I trained there for a, for a couple of weeks, and they sent me to California. Okay. And from, from California, I 
got on a, they put me on a troop carrier and I ended up in New Guinea. Wow. That was about uh, 20 something days after I left the United States. Mm -hmm. And I was in New Guinea. They had a shipyard down there that was putting LCT, landing craft tanks, mm -hmm. uh, together down there in New Guinea. And so when they got ours ready, <clears throat> we went aboard and went out testing the ship to see if everything was working proper. Mm -hmm. And we also fired our guns at a target pulled by an airplane. Mm -hmm. and then we left there, <clears throat> went around the southeast coast of uh, New Guinea, up the northern coast of New Guinea from Otapi and into Hollandia, New Guinea. Mm -hmm. and we was up there a while and they decided to use us because there wasn't any uh, docks over there on those islands. Uh -huh. So big big tankers and, sh and freighters couldn't get into the beach. So what they would do is they would load the, what the, the supplies they had down on our ship mm -hmm. and we'd carry it into the beach. So that's what we were doing uh, up uh, when we were in New Guinea. Uh -huh. Then about uh, six months later, they sent us up to Morta, which is in the Hellamahar Islands, just east of the Celebes Islands. Mm -hmm. And they loaded us up with hand grenades. We were going to make an amphib landing in Borneo. You know where Barneo is? No, no, I don't. <laughs> and anyhow, we got in the convoy to go to Borneo then, mm -hmm. Terracan Borneo, which is in the North Borneo. And the reason we were going into Borneo, the Japanese were getting their oil from Borneo. So we decided, or they decided to take Borneo and run the Japanese out of there so they mm -hmm. couldn't get any more oil. Right. And so we landed in Terracan Barneo, loaded with hand grenades. They loaded our ship six feet high. What it was, was uh, I can show you what it looks like. Okay. It's, it's just like a big barge on it. That's what it looked like. Wow. It's, it's flat bottom. It was uh, 30, 30 inches, 30 feet wide, uh -huh. and 120 feet long. Wow! And uh, we had a big open deck. It's just like a big truck run backwards because yeah. we had a ramp on the front. We could drop the ramp, run in on the beach, drop the ramp, uh -huh. and drive a truck or car, anything, uh, aboard ship. And, and that's the way they unload her. So we got into Barneo and uh, landed and they unloaded our ship and somebody up big shots didn't figure out something right. So when we got unloaded, the tide went out and left us high and dry. Oh wow. Now when a landing craft goes into the beach, uh -huh. their anchors are on the stern of the ship. Okay. Well, most of them's on the bow. Well, they, that's good for two reasons. That keeps you, while you're on the beach, you keep a tight line and keep your landing craft from turning sideways mm -hmm. by waves and things. And it also helps you when you get off, coming off the beach, to pull you off straight. Because you pull you off with a with an anchor winch. Uh -huh. And that's why the, the anchors were on the stern. Oh, okay. And so we was on there for, oh, about nearly 20 days, high and dry. Mm -hmm. So the skipper had us to paint the ship. <laughs> <laughs> so then we got off of there, and uh, we made some we made some runs up to uh, southern Philippines mm -hmm. and Tower Tower, which is a southern island of the Philippines, mm -hmm. which wasn't far up there. We went up there to get uh, some fuel for aircraft because at 
Terra Cambonio, there was a big airstrip there. Mm -hmm. And so there's planes coming in because they've been up in the Philippines uh, running, bombing the Philippines, and they didn't have enough fuel to go back to Morta. Oh. So that's, so they wanted to refuel them at Terracan. Mm -hmm. And so we went up there and got a hundred barrels each. Now there was 12 of us landing craft went up there. Uh -huh. So we got a hundred barrels, 55 gallon barrels of aviation fuel. Wow. And came back down to Terracan and uh, unloaded those. And then they decided uh, that we was going to make an amphib landing in the southern part of Barneo, mm -hmm. which was Balakapapin. Mm -hmm. And it's all in that, yeah, you can read it in there. Yeah. And that's, uh, <laughs> so we were loaded then with observation planes, which they call a grasshopper. Our Air Force called it, Army called it a, a, a a grasshopper because it looked like a grasshopper. It looked like a pipe of cubs, what it was. Yeah. <laughs> and so they loaded uh, four of them aboard our ship, mm -hmm. took the wings off, and we went to Battle of Papin Barney we in a convoy. And when we got there, we run them out on the beach and they put the wings on them and used them to tell the gunners and the big ships behind us back there where to land their sh shells. Hmm. And so after that, we went back to Terracan and stayed a few days, and they wanted us to go to Lady in the in the Philippines, mm -hmm. the island of Lady. So we went, went over there, and a lot of times there we unloaded ships. Like I said, there wasn't any docks. Mm -hmm. So we'd go out and tie up to them, and they'd offload on us, and we'd carry it to the beach. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so about just before the war was over, uh, they wanted us to carry some army personnel to Cebu, another island in the Philippines mm -hmm. that had a big city, which was Cebu City, uh -huh. C-U-B-O, and so we carried them over there and stayed the whole 30 days and then brought them back to Lady, and when we came back in the Lady, there were ships everywhere in there. I never seen them, didn't know the Navy had that many ships. Yeah. But they had aircraft carriers, battleships, cruisers, destroyers, every yeah. kind of ship the Navy had. Uh -huh. And we wondered what the reason was. Well, the reason was they were planning to make an invasion of Japan and also Formosa, our island just south of, which the Japanese own, was just south of, the, of Japan. Mm -hmm. And so we were supposed to go to Formosa. So they're getting ready to load us, and by the meantime, they were dropping the atomic bombs on Japan. Uh -huh. And before they got us loaded, Japanese give up. Yeah. So we were in Philippine Harbor there when the war was over, but I was the youngest mechanic on the ship, and uh, the other two, one guy was from uh, Joliet, Illinois, and the other mechanic, we had three mechanics on mm -hmm. there. One guy was from Kansas, and I got to see them after World War II when I came home, because wow. I was working at a place up in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and I was sent to Chicago to uh, a school, and while I was there, I was there on a weekend, and I knew one of the mechanics lived at Juliet, which is just south of Chicago. Mm -hmm. So I called him, got his phone number, and called him, and he wanted me to come down for the weekend, so I went down there, and I got to see him. Uh -huh. So uh, then the other one lived in Kansas, and I found out through this magazine where he was, and uh, so I got in touch with him, and we talked on the phone, and he wanted me to come to Kansas to see him. Yeah. Well, I said, okay, so I caught a plane <laughs> and flew out to Kansas, and uh, 
got to spend the weekend with him, mm. him and his wife. That's him, a quiet headed guy in the corner up there. Oh, uh huh. His name was Henry G. Light, L I G H D. Uh -huh. He's dead now. Both of them are dead, mm. the other mechanics out here. And uh, the other mechanic in Joliet was William Chadwick. Okay. So I got to see both of my, the only two that I've seen aboard the ship because the landing, landing craft had as a crew 14 pers personnel. Okay. Had a, two officers and the rest of us was enlisted men. Okay. And uh, three mechanics and some deckhands and a gunner's okay. mate and, all, and a, uh, a, a radio man. Mm -hmm. So we... That was that was the crew of a landing craft of a LCT. Wow. Now they were LST, mm -hmm. which was four hundred and something feet long, <clears throat> and there was an LCM, which was just smaller than the LST, mm -hmm. and then there was a LCI, which a landing craft infantry that carried uh, troops in. They'd carry a whole. A company of troops in on one landing, uh -huh. and we were LCT landing craft tank, but we never had a tank aboard. <laughs> <laughs> wow! And so do because you? Because I was so young, I had to stay overseas with the ship because mm -hmm. we couldn't get any replacements to replace me over uh -huh. there. And what we were doing then. We were doing just opposite of what we had been doing. The things that they wanted to bring back to the United States, they'd load them on us on the beach, and we'd carry them out and they'd load them on a big ship and bring them back. <laughs> so we were doing uh, this return, what we, what we were taking now, and now we are putting them back. Wow. And I had to stay over there. Let's see, the war was over in August. Mm -hmm. And I had to stay over there until March the next year. Wow. Because I, I wasn't but uh, 20 years old then. So that's, that's my tour of duty. You can read it in that thing. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to word it better, you can read that yeah. <laughs> thing and word it for No, that is great. So do you remember, do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I didn't get that. Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was in, in December of 41. Mm -hmm. I was on a farm up here. I wasn't in the military. I didn't go okay. in until 44. Because uh -huh. I wasn't but 15 years old. Then. Right. Then, so uh, I wasn't, in, wasn't even thinking about going in the military. Right. But after I got... 17 and 18 and seeing uh, the news of what the army was doing mm -hmm. and sleeping in foxholes, I said, I didn't want that. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I went in the Navy. Yeah. Yeah. So when did you meet your first wife? Your, I, your first wife? I married her in 47 after I got out of the Navy. That's her with, a, with me. <clears throat> But I knew her ever since she was about four or five years old. She was from the same area where we were lived. Uh -huh. And then uh, we married in, uh, 40, in 47, September of 47, and she passed away in 72. She wasn't but 43 years old. Wow. And so, uh, and a good friend of hers and mine, we were living in Somerville, South Carolina when she passed away. Mm -hmm. And a good friend of ours that went to the same church we did kept wanting me to meet another woman. Mm -hmm. This was two years after uh, she had passed away. And I, I kept putting them off. I, I said, no, I, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so she tricked me. This, this woman tricked me. How'd she do that? She she called me one Friday. She just lived two doors from me. Uh -huh. And she called me and says, 
we want you to come to dinner tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was working with the Polaris Missile Base then. Uh -huh. We were working on missiles for submarines down in, in, Char in Charleston. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so I kept putting her off and she finally talked me into coming to dinner. So I said, okay. <clears throat> So when she got ready to hang up, she says, by the way, the woman that I've been trying to get you to be <laughs> staying the weekend with us. That's her right there on that end. Wow. <laughs> and she's a Yankee. Uh-oh. <laughs> she, she was from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay. But she was living in Charleston. Well, she was living in Mount Pleasant at that time because mm -hmm. she... Uh, was working with the uh, outfit that transferred her to to Charleston, mm -hmm. and uh, she was 47, 46 when I met her, mm -hmm. and she'd never been married. And <clears throat> so after I met her, we started dating then, and about nine months after we had been dating, we'd go out to dinner and things like that, and and. Uh, we come home one night after we'd been out to, to, to dinner, mm -hmm. and I sat down and went to her, I carried her home, and she invited me in, so I'd been in there before. Uh -huh. and <clears throat> she told me to sit down that she had to feed her cat, because the cat was meowing right <laughs> there. So she went in the kitchen and fed the cat. When she come out, she stood right in front of me and says, you know what? I says, what? She said, I want to get married. Now, both of my wives invited me to marry them. Yeah. I didn't invite them. <laughs> wow. And I says, Doris, I said, that was her name. I says, you're 46 years old and never been married. Do you know what you're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> and she said, we'll have to talk about that. I said, okay. So then we'd talk about it at every day. I was dating her usually twice a week, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, so every day we'd talk about it, and I said, one day, I said, well, this might as well give up, I can't. <laughs> so I told her to set a date, and we married in May of 1975, okay. Well, my first wife had died in 72. Mm -hmm. This was three years later. Mm -hmm. So uh, we married in, in May. <clears throat> we had 28 years together, mm -hmm. and she, in 1996, she began to stumble and like she was going to fall. Mm -hmm. And I come to find out, she had spurs growing in her spine, putting pressure on her spinal cord. Wow. And she finally lost the use of one leg and one arm. Of course, <clears throat> we, I, I couldn't find enough people to take care of her where we lived down there. I had one woman to take care of her in daytime, but I couldn't find anybody in Mount Pleasant to take mm -hmm. care of her at night because I couldn't take care of her. Mm -hmm. So uh, we went into an assisted living mm -hmm. place in Mount Pleasant. And uh, so we was in there two years and all of a sudden, the, somebody else bought out the company that owned the assistant living place, mm -hmm. and they notified me that they couldn't take care of my wife anymore. So <clears throat> that's how I came up here. My brother in Seneca <clears throat> was, uh, knew, knew about this place, so he got me in touch with them here. Mm -hmm. So I talked to them up here, and they told me to come up here and that my wife had to be bedridden mm -hmm. because she was, had lost the use of her leg and arm. Right. And so they said they'd put her in the health care center over here and I could rent this apartment. That was uh, 12 years ago this month because oh. I moved up here in 03. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I've been here 12 years. She lived two and a half months and passed away over there. Mm -hmm. So I've been by myself since uh, '04 when she died in January of '04. Okay. Wow.
I'm so sorry, I'm all... <laughs> so, after, after you had left the war, um, what was your job when you My came job, back here? Uh, uh, when I was in the Navy, uh -huh. I was a mechanic on a diesel engine. And after you, the war ended and you came back to America, what was your job? Oh, well, <clears throat> the Navy had sent me to engineering school, which I told you. Uh -huh. So I got in touch with an engineering firm in Houston, Texas. Okay. In 1955, mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted me to put in an application, so I sent them an application, and they put me to work. It was for industrial x-ray engineers. Huh. So I went to work for them, and what we were doing then, we were inspecting natural gas pipelines where they welded them together, We'd oh. x-ray them to see how the well was. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I did that for uh, eight years, well, uh, three years, and they made me a field supervisor over all the engineers. Mm -hmm. I was transferred from Houston to Woodbridge, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. and we had an office up there, and they made me a supervisor up there. So what I was doing was checking all the engineers to see if, if they had trouble or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I was traveling for the company more than anything else. Uh -huh. But I wouldn't take the job unless my first wife could, would, couldn't go with me. Right. So they agreed. <laughs> so she got to travel with me, and, and I think I put uh, about 90-something thousand miles on one car in two years, no, two and a half years. And then they gave me a new car, mm -hmm. And I put 80-something thousand miles on it. <laughs> and the boss wanted me to go to Germany, to, uh, to uh, England, because we had some work over there for AT&T, was mm -hmm. building uh, things to, for relay stations uh -huh. and, uh, over in England. So... I went home and told my wife about it, and I couldn't carry her with me over there, and I was going to be over there four to six months. And so uh, she didn't want me to go, so I went back and told the boss that uh, I couldn't go. Mm -hmm. So he fired me. And I was in New Jersey, so I told my wife, I said, load up, we're going We'll get a, somebody to move us, and we're moving back to South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Cause she was happy about it then. Yeah. <laughs> so I left up there and come home, come back here to Seneca. And when I got here, I had a phone call from the boss that just fired me up in New Jersey. He says, "I want you to go to to." Charleston Naval Shipyard down there. I want you to inspect a submarine down there. Because wow. I've been inspecting submarines up in, uh, well, I had crews to do it. I didn't inspect them, mm -hmm. but I overseen it. We, we were shipping. In 1943, uh, Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in, in, up in New Hampshire mm -hmm. was building submarines. They built two, usually they built two at a time. Mm -hmm. They were attack submarines. And one of them was ready to go, so they sent it out for shakedown crews to check to see if everything was working. Mm -hmm. And while they were out, they put it in the dive, and it went to the bottom. And it's still on the bottom off the coast with the crew ab aboard. Wow. So they called me, and, and I was in New Jersey, and We've been inspecting up there anyway, mm -hmm. so they called me and wanted me to bring six crews up there mm -hmm. and uh, inspect the sister ship. Mm -hmm. So we got, I got up there with the crews, and we went to work, and they said, by the way, we need somebody with a top secret or clear, clearance. And I said, well, I'm the only one that's got top secret or clearance. I said, what do you want with it? Yep. want you to work in the reactor room on a submarine because a regular 
guy can't work in there unless he got top secret clearance. And I says, okay, I can work in there. I'll do whatever you want in there. Mm -hmm. I said, well, we want you to inspect some 10 inch stainless steel pipe in the reactor room because mm -hmm. we think that's what caused the other ship to go to bottom. So I went in there and carried some. I had some uh, iridium 192. You know what that is? Yeah. Radioactive isotope. Yeah. Okay. And I carried it in there with some film. And I was extra in this 10 inch stainless steel pipe where they mm -hmm. welded it together. Mm -hmm. And I found a crack in it. So I think that's what caused the other ship. So uh, I came out and they sent some uh, welders in there to grind mm -hmm. out that crack and re weld it. Mm -hmm. When they did, I went back in there and re x rayed and it was all right. Okay. So I've been a little bit of everything. Seriously? <laughs> wow. Wow. So when we came back to the office, the boss, I knew there was something wrong mm -hmm. because he had promised me in 43, mm -hmm. if everything went good, at first of 43, if everything goes good and our engineers make some money, mm -hmm. every boss man will get a bonus at the end of the year. Well, this was early 44 when I was when I came back from uh, Portland, New Hampshire. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I came back and I said, well, what happened to my bonus? Yeah. <laughs> he didn't like it at all. But what I understood that he didn't figure me in on the bonus and he got my bonus with mm -hmm. his bonus. Mm -hmm. So he got sort of hot and fired me. That's why I had to, then before I got here, he wanted me to go to Charles. Yeah, wow. And I said, man, you just fired me. Yeah. Now you want me to go back to work. He said, yeah. <laughs> so well, I went down to Charleston and, and uh, had an engineer down there and mm -hmm. a helper. And uh, they sent a, a mobile home down there with a dark room in it mm -hmm. and a viewing room and an office. So I had the office down there and over the engineer and the helper. And uh, what they didn't, they hadn't been used to working on submarines. Mm -hmm. And so they, he wanted me to in, show him how to x-ray submarines, mm -hmm. certain things on submarines. Cause it was, the hull on that submarine that we were x-raying was two inches thick. Wow. Steel. And it was welded. They had cut out a place to let something in, put something in there, and they were welded it back on, and that's where they wanted me to inspect it. They wow. wanted me to see that it was inspected right. Uh -huh. So I did, finished up the job down there in about, oh, six, eight weeks. And uh, I called in and told him, I said, well, we finished down here. He says, I want you to come back up here. I said, what do you want me to do up there? <laughs> he says, I want you to, because he gives somebody else my job. That's one reason he wanted to fire me. Because uh -huh. he had a buddy from Oklahoma, and he was from Oklahoma. And he, oh. wanted, he gave him my job when he fired me. Mm -hmm. So I said, what do you want me to do up there? He says, I want you to teach all the new men coming in here how to x-ray different pipes and everything we, we x-ray. Uh -huh. I want you to teach them how to develop film and how to read film, interpret it for, for defects. And I says, no, I'm not coming back up there. <laughs> but he didn't know while I was in Charleston. <laughs> I knew I put in that they they wanted me to put in the application to work in the navy yards there in the inspection department, uh -huh. and somehow or another Polaris Missile Base, which is up in North Charleston, mm -hmm. wanted me to put in a job for with wanted me to put in a job for work for them, because they were inspecting missiles with a twenty five million volt X ray machine, wow. and they didn't have anybody to do it, so they wanted me to go to work for them. Mm -hmm. So I put in an application for them, and they said, well, now it might take 
a month before we get before we hire you, mm -hmm. but uh, we'll have to. It has to go in in time, and anything has got to do with government. It takes time. Uh huh. Anyhow, so when I finished down there, I came back up here because I had a job in Seneca up here. Mm -hmm. I was an electrician at one time, so uh, I came back from here and went to work. And I was working at Clemson here, doing some electrical work here in Clemson. Oh. And my wife called me and says, you got a letter from Polaris Muscle Base. Want you to come down for an interview. I <laughs> said, hmm, okay. <laughs> So I told my boss up here, he said, that's all right, you go on down there. I said, I'll go down there Sunday, have an interview Monday, and be back to work here Tuesday. He mm -hmm. said, okay. So I went down for an interview. They said, we'll let you know. So I government again. Mm -hmm. So I come back and went to work up here. And two weeks later, got another letter from Polaris Muscle Base down there, mm -hmm. wanting me to take a physical up here and then bring the results to them down there and take a physical for the civil service down there. Mm -hmm. And if I pass the physical down there and up here, I got a job with the government. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, went down there and they gave me a job mm -hmm. operating a 25 million volt x-ray machine. Wow. They call it a beta tron. But I could, what they was doing, they were setting missiles up mm -hmm. on a on an elevator. Mm -hmm. And you could turn them around or you could raise them up or down. Mm -hmm. And uh, with, it, it was on that elevator we could pull a Betatron, it was on a crane, and we could pull it up so close and shoot right through that missile. Uh -huh. The missile was 84 inches in diameter. Wow. Now, you didn't know they was just this big, did you? No. But the missiles were submarines, 84 inches in diameter, 24 of them aboard ship. Wow. Now, I can't tell you how many warheads on them. If I did, I'd have to shoot them. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the secret we had to... Agree on. Wow. We couldn't tell how how many uh, warheads was on it. Wow. But uh, so if you could if if you could do it all again, would you do it again? Probably, yeah. 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 So I went to work for them in '65. Okay. Polaris Missile Base, and worked till '87. Uh, uh huh. Well, my Navy time and uh, my time with them, I had. 22 years with them, civil service, and then I had over two years with the Navy. I ended up with over 25 years. Uh -huh. And Jimmy Carter got me, caused me to retire. Really? He was going to move the Polaris Missile, which he did, uh -huh. move the Polaris Missile Base to Georgia. Wow. Anytime a president gets a job, he likes to move everything yeah. in, in his state. So they were moving, they were closing the Polaris Missile Base in, in 87 when mm -hmm. I was. They wanted me to go to Georgia and keep the job that I had, which was an instructor, uh, weapons, uh, weapons. What was it? I don't know. I, I forgot now. Yeah. So I was instructor on how to build, put components, clean components, inspect them, and put them aboard the land of the missile. Mm -hmm. That's what I was doing. Wow. So they wanted me to go down there and do the same thing. Uh -huh. And I said, no, I'm not going down there. So I checked with personnel down there. I told him, I says, see how much money I'll give if yeah. I retire and keep my hospitalization and keep my insurance. Mm -hmm. So and a few days later, I got a letter from them. I said, you, you draw so much money, you can keep your insurance and everything. Uh -huh. So I said, I told the boss, I said, I'm going to retire in January of 87. Mm -hmm. So I did. Wow. So I've been retired 
28, nearly 29 years. Wow, wow. But well, I've, we've, we've enjoyed it because we bought a motor home, our second wife and I. Yeah. And we traveled, we went to Montana, we went to Texas, we went to Florida, mm -hmm. Kentucky. We, we, we traveled quite a bit. Wow. In that motor home. Went to California one time. She had a sister in, in uh, Sacramento, so okay. we went out to see her sister. Wow. So we enjoyed it. I enjoyed retirement because yeah. I was doing a lot of traveling. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your service. We really appreciate it. And thank you for the interview, well, too. Well, <laughs>